fifth DAA lecture. Um, it's really a big deal for us in the Distinguished Architecture Alumni Group to look back and realize that since 1997, we've recognized 25 distinguished alumni through this program. Um, we will get to this year's winner, Laura Long, in just a couple of moments. But if I could, I know some folks are standing in the back, so I'm not just going to ask you to stand. If you're seated, if you could stand, if you're a past DAA recipient, if you're in the back, just kind of wave. But we'd like to recognize those who are present. And with no further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage D Dean Carl Dobman for an official welcome to LTU and a kickoff of the lecture. Official. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's here. It's great to have the Distinguished Architecture alumni. We had at least one other Distinguished Architecture alumni joining by Zoom a few minutes ago and maybe online. We probably have students and faculty and other alum online tonight as well. Uh, it's just, it's an exciting time at LTU. It's great to have the Distinguished Architecture alumni here. Can't wait for Laura's presentation. It brings new energy every year and it brings a whole bunch of new ideas and, and kind of advisors into the college. Uh, you'll talk about one of the other initiatives that's been started. Uh, but maybe the other thing, since we had the Distinguished Architecture alum identify themselves, the other thing that I would draw attention to tonight is that we have a number of freshmen in the room. And I think you rolled your eyes before because I was like, are you guys all freshmen? <laughs> but to me, it's such a great thing. We have one of the largest incoming classes into the college in probably the last 10 years. And our freshmen are incredibly engaged. So if, how about if all the freshmen could raise their hands? which is kind of like this whole group through the middle. And so there's a nice relationship between the students that are joining tonight. It's really great that you're here to be part of this, but you can also see a kind of future for yourselves with the Distinguished Architecture alumni as well in terms of what they've accomplished and what they're doing. So I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. It's great to have you here. And I'll turn it back to Tracy. Welcome again to all the students, including all those freshmen. Thank you guys for like being right up front and center. That's something that we're never quite sure how that's gonna work out. Um, maybe in a little bit more of the near term, one of the things that we just started, uh, the inaugural year is this year, but the Distinguished Architecture alumni, all of the past winners, have gotten together and we put together an annual scholarship that's available to a graduating senior who wants to continue studies here at LTU in the graduate program. So this is the first year that we've been able to make that award and it will be every year following. Um, we were hoping that FD McCooley was gonna be able to join us this evening. Um, I think there were some traffic problems. She was definitely intending to come. So I'd just like to read just a moment from her bio to give you a sense for her accomplishments and maybe a bit of why she's involved with the program. FD is the first graduate recipient of the DAA scholarship. She's currently pursuing a Master of Architecture program here at LTU and working for Smith Group, maybe Smith Group kept her a little late tonight, um, as a junior architect in their firm. She believes um, in designing something that lasts rather than something that trends, which is I think something that we talk about a lot and something that lends some weight to work. And um, she has a curiosity about innovative solutions and she's looking to discover, experiment, and inspire. So we're hoping that that first year scholarship will help her out with that as she enters her graduate studies. And for all the students that are sitting here in the front couple of rows, I'd advise you to keep your eyes open for that when you're in that position if you're looking to move into the graduate program here at LTU and apply for that scholarship because we're looking forward to many more years of helping students to continue education here. I'm gonna check my run of show. Yep, we did that, did that. <laughs> All right, we're good. So there's only one thing left to do and it is the most important thing and it's the thing that we all came here for this evening. And I would like to introduce our 25th recipient of the DAA award, Laura Long. Ever since receiving a fellowship in sustainability during her graduate studies, Laura has been passionate about reducing embodied carbon in buildings. 
Her participation is integral to the sustainable design for multiple NOR community projects in the US and in Canada. During her tenure at NOR, Laura has moved from project manager to studio manager and senior associate. She represents the US on the firm's Global Sustainability Committee and has helped to create a blog series on carbon neutrality, has co-written the AIA 2030 Sustainability Action Plan for NOR, and is actively working toward developing a plan to help educate and inform NOR's clients and staff on the importance of pursuing zero carbon, zero water, and zero waste in the buildings it designs. Laura's sustainability focus was a big part of the reason that she was selected by our committee for this year's award, and I'd like to welcome her to the stage to share her thoughts and to hand over this shiny hardware here on the podium. <laughs> I think that's the appropriate way. Good? It's official now. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. I am going to gather my stuff. Gosh. It's official. Wow, Gus, Steve, this is beautiful. Well done. <laughs> nice design. Thank you very much, Tracy, and congratulations to Efti. May we have many more scholarships like that moving forward. I just want to say, Good evening to all of you, and it's so nice to see all these freshmen here. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. Um, I would like to start by thanking a few individuals, and I want to start with Kirsten Lyons. Um, Kirsten was the one who nominated me for this award. She is a fellow student, and also uh, she has taught here at Lawrence Tech. Um, oops, sorry, I don't want to advance that. Boy, a touchy mouse pad. This is my computer, too. Um, I'd also like to thank the people who actually wrote nomination letters for me, Dan Farrow, Janice Means, and Anthony Ricciuti for recommendation letters, writing the recommendation letters on my half, behalf. Finally, I'd like to thank the Distinguished Architecture alumni for giving me this award and welcoming me so kindly and so um, graciously into your fold. Thanks to all of you. This was when I was going to have you stand up too, so Tracy beat me to that. <laughs> so I'd like to start by going back 16 years. Good? All right. I had some amazing opportunities while I was at Lawrence Tech, and I'd like to take a few minutes to thank some, a few folks. I had some amazing relationships that were established here that made a lasting impression on me. And to those who exposed me to opportunities and thought process, processes that helped me to become the professional I am today, First, I'd like to start with Dean Glenn Leroy, former Dean Glenn Leroy. My gosh, was he amazing. It's probably the same people feel the same way about you, Dean Carl. But I just want to let you know some of the things I was, I was able to do while I was here. And I, I encourage all of you freshmen that are in this audience tonight to think about ways in which you can help influence this university while you're here as students. He got me in involved in a lot of things. And I was on the, the Dean's Student Leadership Council I was also the Studio Culture Committee leader, and I just want to mention that that committee helped bring back the 24-hour access for studios. So for, th for some of you that actually um, might be sleeping, using sleeping bags underneath your desk in studio, you can thank our committee. One of the things that I really appreciated about Dean Leroy is that he really saw something in me, and I know he saw things in several people. And one of the things that he did was he actually had me be part of the, the NAB accreditation team. So I actually wrote, I, was act, I acted as a student representative on that team. I also secretly did some of his drafts for him, um, which he did a very good job editing, by the way. Um, and in addition, he gave me the first fellowship to grad school here. And I don't know if there's been one since, but basically he paid for my college, graduate school, and in return, I did some amazing research um, studies. I just want to mention to him, before I talk about some of those things, is he gave me good advice then. We met for lunch many, many times after, going, after I graduated, and he continues to give me advice to this day. And actually, he wished me the best of luck tonight. Janice Means is another person who meant a lot to me 
at school, and she still does. I worked on the 10K photovoltaic project with her, which you probably see on top of the engineering building. Um, worked with um, both uh, Professor Rob Fletcher and that, that group. And we also had a, uh, wonderful graphics up on the fourth floor, so when you came to look at the photovoltaic array up there, you could see the work that we had done and the study and the involvement that, we, that went into that. And working with those electrical guys over there, wow. <laughs> I learned a lot on that one, too. In addition to that, Janice also got me on the SOS um, on the environment seminars that we had here. She would have guest speakers come in and educate students and also local design professionals and, and engineers uh, on, on things we could do to help improve our environment, and especially the built condition. So for a couple of years, I volunteered on that group, and then when I actually was a grad student, I actually presented to that, to that group. I was on several faculty search committees, and I can honestly say that I have not found anyone, any, I have not had anybody support me more in my endeavors like Janice has. I hope someday she will stop telling everyone she meets in my presence that I was the best student she ever had. It does get to be a little embarrassing after a while. In addition to Janice, I'd like to also mention Ed Orlowski. Massive Change Studio, which is a class I had in graduate school here, was the most inspiring class I ever had at Lawrence Tech. I remember every, I did an exercise for, for Ed during that, that class, and I remember every detail of that exercise. After leaving a homeless shelter in Lansing, which is where I was living at the time, after talking with some folks there, I turned the corner after I left and saw this elaborate high-priced condo building and nothing to, the, to this day has hit me as hard as seeing the social inequity that, can, that I witnessed that day in architecture. So again, very inspiring class. And for those of you, I think it might be called something a little different, but if you're interested in sustainability, I highly recommend you take that graduate class with, with Ed. In addition, I'd like to mention Rochelle Martin. <sighs> Sorry. She really helped me to evolve my sense of design theory. She was the kindest, most challenging professor I had at Lawrence Tech, and I enjoyed her perspective on, her, on our profession. She was quick to share books with students, and she even shared jewelry with some of us. She is truly missed. While in grad school, I was given the first fellowship, as I mentioned before, and this is where Dan Farrell comes in. Dan Farrow kind of managed my independent study and also my research. One thing I did with Dan was I created a campus sustainability initiative. Dan supported me through this whole process and even had me present my findings to the campus sustainability committee. Along with Dan, one of my um, graduate research fellowships was doing carbon footprint analysis for Lawrence Tech. It, I think it was the first and only campus or, or carbon study that's been done on this, this campus. I know we've added some more buildings since I've been here, but if there is a student who's ever interested in carrying that tradition on, I will support you all the way and I will be your mentor because I'd like to see it happen. What was really nice about that fellowship and working on the carbon footprint is I had the most amazing support, not only from Dan, but also from the business group, the, ma the facilities people, everybody helped me to do that carbon footprint, and it is a true reflection. We actually measured how much refrigerant loss we had in our mechanical systems on campus. It really was an excellent experience. And I just want to say th thanks to Dan because he was constantly giving me architectural record continuing education articles to read, and I want to thank you for that, Dan. While I was here I, in grad school, excuse me, God, this is... I should have brought my mouse, I, I apologize. My mouse is a lot more, um, I don't usually use my mouse on, or my board on this. Um, it's a little bit more, more tricky than I had imagined. Uh, I just want to stress too that one of the things with that footprint is that I had to figure out the commuting for every single student <laughs> on this campus. And thanks to the business office, because if, without them, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And I didn't know your, all, all of everybody's personal addresses, but I used your zip codes to come up with your commuting. Um, that was just about the toughest thing I had done on that project. So in addition, I, was, I did teach while I was in grad school. I taught BizCom 1, 
thanks to Gretchen Rudy. And I was an academic advisor, although I know Leslie would not like me saying advisor. But I had uh, actually 90 students per term that I advised while I was here. And while Leslie McKellick, uh, excuse me if I pronounced it incorrectly, um, when she took a sabbatical, I actually was, I stepped in as student service coordinator during grad school. I had an excellent education at Lawrence Tech. My thanks to all of you. So I can't start this presentation on sustainability without giving some background first. Please forgive me for this teaching moment. And maybe this moment might be a little bit longer than a moment. I want to start with the 2015 Paris Agreement. This established the goal of keeping planetary warming below 2 degrees Celsius while pursuing efforts to limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Since then, the world has quickly been depleting this 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget. All of the current global architectural and engineering initiatives you see listed here stem from the Paris Agreement. Excuse me. One of the things we did on, on NORA's Global Sustainability Committee is we re researched all of these agreements to, to, figure out, to figure out which one we wanted to, to follow. We are a global company. We do projects all over the world. And we ed actually ended up going with Architecture 2030 because it was more close to our profession. But in addition, while we were doing that, our structural vice president out of Toronto also signed us up for SE 2050, which is basically the structural engineer's version of Architecture 2030. So the idea of all the, the current global architecture and engineering initiatives that are out there, we still are at risk. We still are at risk of limiting, sorry, just want to, we're still at risk uh, of not meeting that 1.5 degree carbon um, initiative. So I just want to um, kind of just go back one minute, sorry. I should have asked somebody if they had a mouse. Anybody? Yeah, good idea. Thank you. I don't know why I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, actually, you got a, you got one. I have a, I have a um, USC port. Oh, I mean, actually, I got an adapter. I've got an adapter. Oh, I don't. It's over there. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. Um, so one, of the, one more thing I want to mention before I, I move on. Um, excuse me for me go back to this. With this limiting a planetary warming to 1.5 degrees rather than 2 is critical. And the reason why we, that 0.5 degrees Celsius is so critical is that difference, that difference in global warming means that 1.7 billion more people will be exposed to severe heat waves every five years. 100 to 400 million more people will be at risk of hunger. One to two billion more people will no longer have adequate water. The world can also expect more extreme droughts, precipitation, flooding, and vector-borne diseases, among other catastrophes. Does this sound familiar to anybody? So what are the goals of this initiative? What is Architecture 2030 all about? Ideally, we want to achieve a 50 to 65 percent reduction in CO2 emissions from the built environment by 2030, and ideally, zero emissions by 2040. The original goal was 2030, but we realized way back when we just couldn't make, um, make, make those goals. And it was very clear at COP26, for those of you who keep a, aware of climate, the UN meets once a year. There's a, a climate a panel climate that meets every year. And actually, t COP27 is going to be meeting next month. And they realize there's no way in heck we're going to meet that goal. So to kind of give you an idea of what climate change is all about and what, how, what role Architecture 2030 plays in that role, this initiative, believe it or not, started with Ed Masria back in 2002. By 2006, they started to challenge the architectural community to take and adopt these changes in the work that they're doing. By 2010, there were 10-week training classes that had started across the US. And Ann Arbor, Michigan was one of those original cities to hold this training. Some of you were, might have been part of that group. 
To support the 2030 challenge, the American Institute of Architects with Architecture 2030, they work to create the 2030 Commitment Program. It's aimed at transforming the practice of architecture to respond to the climate crisis in a way that puts holistic, firm-wide, project-based, and data-driven. So basically, the, the brainchild is from Architecture 2030, but the data and the information gets disseminated through AIA 2030. So they are the ones who track the database. That's, the, that's who we report our projects to as part of this commitment. So what does architecture play in this whole initiative? Basically, buildings account for almost 40% of global CO2 emissions, 40%. Of those total emissions, building operations are responsible for roughly 28% annually, while building materials and construction, typically referred to as embodied carbon, are responsible for an additional 11% annually. So we've got operational carbon, which means these buildings that are being operated right now, like this one, and then embodied carbon, which is part of the design and, and construction of a building. According to Architecture 2030, in 2040, approximately two-thirds of the global building stock will be buildings that already exist. Without widespread existing building decarbonization across the globe, these buildings will still be emitting CO2 emissions in 2040, and we will not make that 1.5 degree change. So in other words, our profession needs to focus on the built environment, those buildings that are already built. You know, we talk about buildings being the most sustainable, the ones that are already built. Well, we're not addressing that building stock. So we really need to get our firms and our, and our culture and our profession to focus on that existing build, those existing buildings. So achieving embo zero embodied carbon will require us to adapt principles of reuse, which you probably have all heard of, reduction through re reuse including renovating existing buildings using recycled materials and designing for deconstruction, and reduce including materials op optimization and the spe specification of low to zero carbon materials, which is not easy because there's not a lot of information still out there after all this time. And, and the idea of sequestering. If you haven't heard about that, zero, sequestering is basically including the design of carbon sequestering s sites and the use of carbon sequestering materials. And how you sequester? You basically either inject it and capture it and inject it into the ground, which is where carbon comes from in the first place, right? That's where we get oil. Or you can actually use it in building materials. There are companies out there right now that sequester carbon in carpets, in, in, in concrete, and other, other materials. So there's really some amazing technology that's going on out in the world today that we can actually help reduce a building's carbon emissions by the materials that we use to select its design. So achieving zero emissions from new buildings will require energy efficient buildings that use no on-site fossil fuels and are 100% powered by and or off-site renewable energy. This is known as electrification. You guys probably have heard that already, right? What does that mean? That means you're not using any fossil fuels. And this is going to require our grid, our national grid, to have enough support to do that. Right now, California is going um, all EV cars in the future, yet the, we know the grid in California can't support that. So we're, we're legislating stuff, but we don't have the infrastructure to support it. Another dilemma for us. And one last thing I'd like to go over is the circular economy. What the heck is that? Some of you might already have been um, learning this in some of your school studies, but there's concepts related to work by Bill McDon McDonough um, that focuses on cradle to cradle. That's the end goal. Well, we've got to start with cradle to grave first, which is the way we pretty much operate these days. Cradle to grave is a life cycle assessment. It's a methodology used to evaluate natural effects linked to all the phases in the life or product from beginning to raw materials through processing of these materials, manufacturing, dissemination, usage, maintenance, and of course repair and reusing ideally. 
We want to take it one step further, though. We want to go to cradle to cradle, meaning there is a circular economy in the design of this concept. Also known as regenerative de design, it can be defined as it can be defined as the design and pr production and pr of products of all types in such a way that the end of life, at the end of their life, they can truly be recycled or upcycled, imitating nature's natural cycle with everything either recycled or returned to the earth, directly or indirectly, as completely safe, non-toxic, and biodegradable. That's a big task for us in our industry. Because what on earth do we put in buildings sometimes that you can't do anything but, but throw them in the landfill? Right? So that is going to be a very huge challenge for us. But the concept, not on the slide, is cradle to gate. And this is something that we have a little bit more control of right away. Cradle to gate, which is an assessment of partial product life cycle from being extracted from the ground or wherever it came from, taken to the factory, basically, the product coming from, from raw materials, the resource extraction to the factory gate, meaning you gather the raw materials, you manufacture it, it leaves that facility, that's the gate. So once it leaves that manufacturing facility, there's a whole other step that comes. The products come to your job site, they get built, and then what happens to them after they no longer are needed, for example, it's time to demolish a building. We're very good at that. We would rather, some of our clients would rather see something brand new and shiny versus dealing with that existing building stock. So that's, again, another issue that we're facing as in our profession that we really need to take, take a look at. So I want to take, oh, sorry, this is a little bit more simpler for, um, for us. This is something that we did as part of our blog series because that concept is so dense. You know, you could have a whole class on understanding cradle to cradle. But ba basically, this takes the raw material, the transportation of that raw material, the manufacturing of that raw material, and then the trans transportation of whatever was made to the site. It gets put in the building. It's got that product life cycle associated with it. How much carbon is in that, that, that thing that was created? And then what do we do with it? Ideally, we reuse it, we repurpose it, and we, we Compose, decompose it. And I'm going to actually share with you a project um, shortly that does that very thing. Oops. Just read, just read this quote for a second. So how does this idea all relate to the design of new and existing buildings? When just 1% of our project's first cost, meaning us, our, our wages, our work for getting um, a project from a client, 1% of those first costs, which is also the, the purchase of materials and construction, but up to 70% of its life cycle impacts are already determined. When I first read this, it scared the heck out of me. Excuse me. <laughs> when I first read this, I thought, Oh my gosh, so here you have this person in a firm or in, in the, their, you know, their sole proprietor trying to come up with a design for a building. And you ask yourself, who are they coordinating with? Who are they working with? Are they working with a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer? Or are they looking at site conditions? Do they have an idea of, is there a general contractor involved? Maybe it's a design build and, and you have a contractor engaged right away. Who's coming to that table when those designs are first getting created? So the, re, the way to solve this is the idea of the integrative process. This is not new, it's not a new concept, but it was introduced to LEED version four and it's been one of, believe it or not, it's only one point <laughs> for LEED, for those of you who know LEED. But what it means is that that one credit controls the entire design process. Because you have a format that you follow where you invite all the stakeholders to the table. It's a comprehensive approach where we look at everything. 
regardless of whether you're pursuing a certification because of an, or whether you're just designing a building, it's important because it encourages integration during early design stages where it will be the most effective. The integrated process focuses on engaging energy, carbon, and water-related research and analysis to inform early design decisions through high-level collaboration among project teams. This image that, oh gosh, that's what I get for never not bringing my mouse. I apologize to everybody. This image, um, sorry, this, uh, sorry. <laughs> for those of you who are watching online, I, forgive me. Um, the image that you see below is actually an image that Nor did. It's a sketch of Bertha Park High School in Perth, Scotland. And it shows some of the passive house design strategies Nor used in this building. You have to understand where a building is sited, where the sun's coming from, where the wind's coming from. A lot of you have heard this already. But you need to understand how that affects space within your building, how it affects the design of that exterior. Passive House is a very promising um, certification process. It's very popular in the UK. It's getting popular in Canada as well as the United States. And honestly, I think it's going to get to a point where we have the ability to surpass LEED and lead, lead is leadership in energy and, and environmental design, for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's a certification that's very common in the US, but it has some weaknesses. And there is a new president at USGBC now, Peter Templeton, and he understands that LEED is falling behind. There's strategies like Passive House, the Living Building Challenge, and other things that are, um, that are moving to the forefront because they are much more designed um, to, to be effective. So I just want to stress that that is really important. And again, if we don't challenge ourselves to learn these new technologies, these new certifications, and how they affect the building, we're not going to succeed in that, with that 1.5 degree Celsius. So I'm going to kind of transition to actual projects to kind of give you some experience. The first project I did when I came to NOR was CVS. I actually got hired from a career fair here at, at, at LTU to join and work on the CVS prototypes. This was already being managed by someone who was also an LTU grad, and it's now being managed by LTU grads as well. Um, I like the tradition. And this is a great way for, for folks first out of school to kind of cut their teeth, so to speak. But what I enjoy about this client, because I'm still connected to this, to this, this client in a, in a pretty major way, um, they have come a long way, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Just so you know, we did not design the prototypes when I came on board. We did not have anything to do with what they looked like. We weren't involved with it. We just managed the prototypes. Ten years later, NOR had become the sole AOR managing their prototype library, and we helped to create the new design you see in this image. During our time with this Fortune 5 company, we have been tasked with creating everything from process manuals to ADA manuals, new store cost initiatives, and with the start of COVID, I actually got a chance to research methodologies on how aerosolized pathogens can be neutralized in their stores and health clinics. That was quite a trip. I learned a lot. Um, but today, we are in the process of doing an embedded and operational carbon analysis of their current design and conducting a life cycle assessment on their current store design. Once that is complete, we will be then reevaluating the building out the envelope to look at mechanical, electrical, things that we can do to really help reduce the carbon of this building. Ultimately, we're probably going to end up adapting to electrification, meaning get rid of, uh, get, getting rid of fossil fuels. The idea of moving to regenerative design, meaning the idea of that cradle-to-cradle -cradle footprint, we're hoping to achieve some of that with CVS. They hired this amazing woman to be their creative designer on staff. She is actually trained in biomimicry, uh, for those who know that if you haven't. Um, there's an excellent book out there that describes what biomimicry is. You think about Velcro, how that got created. It was because some guy saw a burr in, a, in a, his dog's hair and wondered what was the technology with that little natural seed that allowed it to be so s sticky to the dog's hair. And that's how Velcro was created. 
believe it or not. So in that very beginning, you know, we were being asked, we went to CVS and we did a presentation on photovoltaics because our energy team didn't know what it was or how it worked. And we were talking about low VOC, pa low VOC paints and finishes. That was the extent of our sustainability discussion. Now we are talking about changing the footprint of that entire corporation, at least from the retail perspective, and helping them reduce their carbon footprint. They are actually capturing carbon. They have a fleet of trucks. You guys see them on the road. They can actually capture the carbon from those vehicles and sell it to people who can use it. For example, Carbon Cure. Carbon Cure is a, is a vendor who can actually take carbon and put it in concrete where it mixes with some of the additives in concrete and turns to limestone. I mean, it's absolutely amazing the technology that's out there. So here we are, a firm in Detroit making massive change to a Fortune 5 company. I have never had better clients than CVS. I've had a lot of great clients in my career at NOR, but the fact that we're being able to influence the, their sustainability, uh, sustainability goals and help change their, their footprint moving forward is one of the most rewarding things that I think I could do in my career. It doesn't matter the kind of architecture you do, it's the change that you make. And I feel very fortunate to have them as a client. One of the first lead projects I did um, for NOR when I was um, probably just maybe a couple of years at NOR at that time um, was the Ojibwe Nature Center. This was designed to reflect its natural surroundings and the shape was controlled by the programming inside. Chad Bernard, who is um, now a principal in education with us, but he was the director of design at the time, used white cedar and stone that was later changed to granite due to the recycle, recycled material made available to the city of Windsor from the Ambassador Bridge. So the granite you see on the outside of this building is, believe it or not, it's the granite blocks used that were originally embedded in the sand in the bridge's ramped row beds to give traction to trucks. When they eventually decided to take it out and put asphalt in, we were able to actually use those, those granite um, blocks on this building. The client, the city of Windsor was our client and they were involved in this process throughout the design and construction and they were with us the whole way. Ideas and design continued to evolve and there were trade-offs due to budget constraints, but the client committed to preserving the environmental integrity of this building and its effect on its surrounding ecosystem encouraged the most out of this design. The use of granite was a huge win for this project. While saving some of the budget, the use of this granite allowed us to achieve all of the right recycled content and re resource reuse lead points. Since its certification, CAGPC's new construction of 1.1, this is a really old project, guys. We're at, at lead 1.0. This was this Canadian Green Building Council, they were a little bit behind the USGBC, United States Green Building Council. But we were able to achieve a lead silver on this project. The center in features expanse windows um, on the north side, which you'll get a chance to see in one more slide. Um, it overlooks the woodland and the, pres the, the preservation of the birding garden, which was always really important to visitors there. It does have a partial green roof and a reconfigured parking area with improved space for buses. The Green Roof sub-consultant for this also created an exhibit for the students. Um, we went, oh, this, this nature center has students come and visit all the time. And they created a, a little mock-up of this green roof, which was an extensive versus intensive green roof, um, so that students could understand how green roofs work. Basically, the, this extensive green roof can support up to 25 pounds of vegetation per square foot, and usually host native drought tolerant and low growing species. For those of you who haven't, I don't know if you, for those of you who haven't um, seen it, the green roof on top of the um, student center, um, that's a pretty cool thing. There's a lot of uh, interesting species of plants up there and you wouldn't even know it unless you got up there. Again, mentioning that the client, um, one of the really nice things about working with these guys is that, um, they wanted this to truly be made of natural materials. So the granite, the white cedar from the outside was brought indoors. Um, and of course we had a, um, this beautiful tree that was saved on site. 
it had, it had died, they captured the tree, cut it in half, and made this great, it was a great place to cover a column in the design. A lot of other lead credits were achieved. We really focused on water efficiency, um, low volatile organic, organic comp uh, compounds for the materials that we put inside. Um, and one of the really nice things about this is that we had a little bit of an issue with the mechanical system. You know, we wanted a Cadillac, and then the client could only afford a Chevy. So we only were able to achieve two out of the 10 credits at this time, only 10 credits for optimized energy. Um, but we did the best we could with this. So it wasn't the, we could have been, we could have pushed the envelope a little further on this, but again, budget constraints are always an issue. Just some additional pictures. Um, this is that beautiful view at the back of the, of the Nature Center. And one thing I wanted to mention here about this Nature Center, are there anyone, is there anyone in this room who lives in Windsor? No, okay, okay, good. Are you familiar with this Nature Center? Okay. Well, one of the things at this Nature Center, basically all throughout um, Windsor, is an endangered species called the Eastern Fox Snake. And our team was able to use some of the demolished material from there was an existing um, kind of a trailer slash outdoor classroom that was used originally for this, this um, nature center. And we took that demolished waste and buried it and made a hibernaculum. And basically what that is is a place for uh, the fox snake and other snakes to hibernate. So you have all these little nooks and crannies where all the, the construction material was kind of bonded together. We covered it with, with dirt and with, with grass, but they're able to burrow down in there and they hibernate over the winter time, but they also um, are able to lay their eggs. So it was a really nice experience, and honestly, um, it was the beginning of some, more, some really interesting more projects um, related to LEED. One of the things I really want to focus on is the Green Garage. How many of you in this room have been to the Green Garage in Midtown? Okay. I love this place. I love the people who run it. I love the whole concept of it. And this, I'm gonna say this right off the bat, this is one of the first truly sustainable projects I worked on, and it's the most sustainable project I've ever worked on in my life. Tom and Pe Peggy Brennan, back when I was probably at NOR for maybe a year, um, they were looking for volunteers, believe it or not, to assist them on the idea of creating an energy zero team. And what was really interesting is that NOR was approached to, to see if we had anybody on staff who would like to do that, and I was chosen because of, they knew my interest in sustainability. So I went to work, um, I went to work with, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> when a mouse, a mouse is really needed. So I went, I actually went there and joined the volunteer group shortly, the Net Zero Energy team, shortly after it was formed. We spent the next year meeting to discuss the building envelope, its design, and things that we could do, let me get back over here, things that we could do to help make this a very sustainable building. So we used high, the concept of a high performance building design, but we also took it to, the, uh, to a much higher level. We sat in this little room. Right now, keep in mind that none of the windows are exposed here, because it was all infilled with masonry. And it was pitch black in that room, and there was no heat. So we sat huddled in that corner in that nice little desk, which now the, in the pictures you see light, but there wasn't any daylighting coming in. It was cold. But we were dedicated. And what we did is we basically came up with some ideas about how we could review the envelope, see what was there, and really augment it. We also talked about um, some very important ideas like daylighting, wind, how we could capture some um, existing materials to use in the building, 
because we didn't want to have any new materials um, brought into the building if we could absolutely avoid it. So what we ended up doing is we first concentrated on the site. How was it oriented? Where was the wind coming from? And we decided that, okay, we need to know if we're going to have daylighting, what kind of w windows do we want to have without costing too much money? So we looked at where the solar azimuth was. We looked at solar elevation. We looked to see what kind of where direction the wind was coming from so that we could truly analyze where, where could we take advantage of daylighting. If we were going to use solar, which we were planning on doing, where would we put it? If we did solar hot water heating, which we also included in this design, where would we put it? So understanding the environment, the site where your building is located, was crucial and was one of the first things we had to do. I actually worked with um, Tom. He, Tom and I both really like A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. I know it's not very popular, but I love that book. And he did too. So we were kind of brainstorming some ideas about how can we, what can we do with the light in that building. And we ended up using um, solar tubes, which are basically tunnels of light that, come, that penetrate the roof to bring daylighting in. Because even though there are these beautiful windows, potentially, in this building, we wondered it's not, it's not going to penetrate deep enough. So how can we bring some daylighting in? So we worked at all these kind of grassroot things to determine what do we want to do with this building. So we ended up basically using daylighting, using solar, solar tubes. There was solar hot water heater, um, solar panels on the roof to really try to bring out the ability to reduce this building's carbon footprint. And when it was all finished, keep in mind, I only st stayed with this group for a year. Um, so I was not part of the, the final design and construction of this, of this building, but I'm, I've been I used to go there all the time regardless whether I was volunteering there or not. The, the ultimate goal was we only used one and a half dumpsters on this building, considering all the waste. Look at this. This is the way the building looks today. And Tom and Peggy really truly believe in the triple bottom line. That means they want it to be economically viable and support their community, but also environmentally um, sound. So it was, it, it was extremely important to them that anything they did in this community, it would do something that would be good for the community. It would help make Midtown more sustainable. It would bring people to this, this facility. It would educate people on sustainability and everything. There are times when I've been in there um, just to visit or to stop by on a Friday lunch, which I'll talk about later, and people would be talking about community networking and things to help not only happen, what happened at the Green Garage, which is really an incubator space, but it's also co-working space. There are a lot of interesting sustainability businesses that work there. But that idea of it being a place to educate and support the community. So this happens to be a picture of the Green Garage as it is today on Noel Night in Midtown, which is a great event for those of you who have never been uh, usually around the first week of some, uh, December sometime. But they have groups meet. It, they open their doors to have people meet there. So I just want to stress that it truly is what they wanted it to be. It's a co-working space with like-minded people who are interested in the environment. Every business in there has some kind of environmental impact. Uh, and they want to be change makers. He, it was really important to Tom and Peggy, Peggy both that they did that. But in addition, while they were doing the green garage, they realized that the green alley needed, the alley right next to them really needed to be addressed. So you can see the before and after. This is the work of the green garage in Motor City Brewing Works, which is just, you know, just down the alley. Actually, you can see the, um, the wall that you see on the left is, is the Motor City Brewing, Brewing Works. They wanted to make sure that this space was designed so that people could feel safe walking through there. It's really well lit at night. And the gardens are beautiful. People just come just to see the gardens. And I just want to stress that Tom and Pecky not only have influenced Midtown and Detroit, but they've influenced Michigan, the United States, and even globally. There are people from all over the world who come to visit this place to learn what they did and how they did it, because it is extremely sustainable. I remember sitting at the table, and Tom and Peggy had just come back from Germany. 
And they also went to Scotland too. They, they checked out a lot of architecture. But they also, what they fell in love with is the research of glazing and the glass. And the, and the R values you can get from glass in Germany that you couldn't get in the United States. And they tried, trust me, they tried to find a glass manufacturer in the US that could duplicate what was going on in Germany. They got, they got really close. But that was, again, just the effort that they wanted to put into this because it, they wanted it to be a mean, meaningful change. So I just want to stress that Tom and Peggy Brennan not only did the Green Garage, but they went on to do the Elmore, for those of you who are aware, aware of that, the Elmore Lodge. It's a place where people have apartments, affordable housing, but you can also um, stay overnight there. Um, and also the Elmore Gardens, again, carrying on that Green Alley tradition. And they, wanted, they added Seasons Market. That market is there to provide fresh produce, and Michigan made products to people in Midtown Detroit. So again, that whole idea of that triple bottom line, community, economics, and environmental um, uh, stewardship. So one of the other, another project we worked on was a winter fire hall, again, a Chad Nadar design. Um, this was the second project we did for the city of Windsor. Again, it, it achieved another LEED silver certification using um, LEED 1.0 again at, with, with CAGBC. I just want to stress what we focused on in here was interior from a, a sustainability perspective. It was extremely important to the fire captain of this hall and the, his team that we ensured that the building was healthy and it was a place for them to live and work in safely. So it was imperative that we pursued as many indoor environmental quality initiatives as we could. And so we focused on low VOC paints, um, materials, but you know, keep in mind, you've got this high bay, which is what the larger structure is where you see the fire trucks, with people running their motors. <laughs> you know, how do we project that inside space from that space to ensure that, that those odors, um, those emissions don't get into the building? So protecting that indoor space was the number one priority for us when we worked on this project. So this is the back of the building. Kind of, you can see the similar features of the design that's kind of carried throughout this. Regional materials were also exemplary, an exemplary performance on this building, meaning we did a darn good job on regional, using regional materials. And for LEED, for those of you who aren't aware, that means you've gotten them within a 500 mile radius um, of the building. And this is just some interior shots to give you an idea. We wanted this to be a comfortable place, a place where they could live, work, and also exercise. The next project we worked on was Emma Munger Elementary School. This was part of the last DPS, Detroit Public School bond program, and we met with local A&E firms, Mark, you were one of them, um, to see how we could, we could strategize um, working out a team, because we needed architects, engineers, um, we needed a Detroit minority presence, and we also needed um, a, a, a um, construction manager on board. So we met, we went to all the meetings, we met with some people, we ended up actually working with Percy Cash and Associates. They were an awesome team to work with. Percy Cash had been doing projects in Detroit for a really long time, and his, his right-hand architect, Dave Van Hamel, was instrumental uh, in helping us. So we reacted in this capacity on this project, not as the architects, but as the engineers and lead administrator. So my team internally did basically all the credits because Cash, Percy Cash and his team had never done lead. So not only did we help educate them on what was required, but we also worked with a team at Turner Construction, who was our partner, that hadn't worked on lead either. So this was a huge challenge for us. Um, and then come to find out, we also encountered some serious phase two uh, environmental hazards on the site. And after doing a phase two and many more cores, we found that it was just so bad. This used to be an old brick, the site of Mung uh, Munger is the site of an old brick factory in Detroit. And you would not believe the stuff we found in that soil. So Detroit Public Schools didn't have the money to, to, to remove that material and put it in an environmentally safe landfill. It had to stay on site. So what are we gonna do with all the stuff, like all that soil from underground, what were we gonna do with it? Well, we ended up making this great sledding, sledding hill for everybody at, at Munger, um, which it actually, it's, it's used like that today. So again, this was a lead silver project, but one of the things that was difficult on this is because 
Every pre-K-8 in that program was the exact same, just a different site. So they all looked the same. But because of that, you would think that as a lead team, there would have been some kind of conversation about, okay, let's all pursue these credits. But there wasn't. There was no conversation with the program managers who helped with this bond program talking about lead. So we reached out to everybody we knew who was working on these projects, and we, we got a team together. We got all the architects and engineers together, and we started strategizing. And finally, the bond team, bond program team, started running the meetings for us. But it took that initiative because, my gosh, it's the same building. Why can't we all go after the same credits? It's just a different site. Of course, this, this uh, was in a neighborhood um, that didn't have a lot of public transportation access, so we didn't go after, we didn't get gold on this. We were close, but we ended up doing lead silver. And I just want to stress this design you see with the interior finishes and the acoustical panels. This was done by Percy's interior designer. And it was so beautiful, he decided, hey, I'm going to present this to Detroit Public Schools and see what they think. And they said, oh my gosh, this is great, we've got to put it in all the pre-K-8s. So not only do the buildings look, like, look the same on the outside, but they also look like the same on the inside because of the interior finishes. But what's really nice is each, each interior designer on these schools picked a different color scheme. But the concept is the same. And again, it was all because of the woman that he had hired to be his interior designer to do this work. This is just, again, another example of trying, how do you deal with acoustics in a gym like this? You know? So we put some panels up, but again, we had a limited budget. We could only do so much. But it, did, it was a little effective, not, not a whole lot, but it did help. Another program that we worked on was um, Wayne State University's um, Advanced Technology Education Center. This is in Warren, Michigan. It's a satellite um, building for Wayne State University. And this was um, our first lead project for the university. This was, um, the team involved was um, Manic Smith was our civil engineer, Crispin Company was our construction manager. They were also our lead administrator, but we did our own lead of credits. But believe it or not, this is what the building looked like first. This is a Farmer Jack store. Abandoned, but it's a Farmer Jack store. And believe it or not, when we were finished with this, we got credits for maintaining lead, um, lead credits for keeping walls, roof, and, and foundation, and slab, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So this is, again, we're getting a little bit more savvy with designs, and we're thinking more consciously about that embodied carbon, right? You, if, you, if you work on an existing building, you want to try and keep as much of the stuff that's in that building as possible, but still s trying to make it worthwhile. So it was an amazing team. Crispin Company, for those of you who don't know, they're an amazing construction management team, and they are really known for their lead, lead projects. Their, their building that they have in Lansing has four lead certifications, four. Pretty amazing group. So this building, uh, as, a, as a student's um, academic building, it achieved two out of three uh, points for building reuse because of the existing floors, roof, and, and we also had brownfield credits. But I just want to stress here that this is advanced automotive technology. It's a, it's a bat we also have a battery lab in this. So we had some, you know, got some little creative, little creative juices flowing. It has um, uh, electric vehicle charging stations, which is really helpful. You, if you want to get a credit for um, charging stations, you have to have 6.5% of the parking capacity open for people to charge their vehicles. That's a lot. But because you saw the size of that parking lot at Farmer Jack, we didn't touch it. Actually, we took parking away, which is another saving grace for this project. This is just some um, photographs of the inside. Um, again, our designer was Chad Menard on this. This is my favorite photo of just about every project we've ever done at NOR except for um, the Renfrew Courthouse in, I believe it's in Ottawa. It might be in Toronto. It was a rehab project. It's actually been an architectural record. It's, one, it's so beautifully done. The merging the classical um, with a more modern design, it was, it's one of the be most beautiful buildings I've seen. But we kind of got this um, idea for the bamboo garden because Chad and I both, I had it with um, Phil Plowright in his ma master class. We went to Toronto, 
and we actually saw the Terrence Donnelly Center for Cellular Biomolecular Research, and it had this beautiful, bam you walk in the door and there's this beautiful ba bamboo garden. It was big enough that students could actually walk through it, and when we were there, students were sitting down, reading, some, actually someone was laying down on a, on a bench and taking a nap. So we like that idea of bringing greenery into this, and that's, I think, one of the focal points of that des that this design. So this is just an example of a typical classroom, but I wanted to include this slide because it shows you the panels that are at the right side of this, this image. Those are, of course, expandable. You can actually slide those away and make the classroom double in size. One of the things that I did while I was um, at Lawrence Tech as a grad student, one of my research um, things I did during my fellowship was to do, I wrote two grants to try to get an engaged classroom for the College of Architecture and Design. For those of you who are not familiar, engaged learning and engaged classroom is where it has flexible space where you can change the way students collaborate with one another. And this, even though this right now you see a bunch of computers, this space can be adapted to have breakout sessions for students to go off and have their own little private discussions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like this design so much, is that these classrooms, because this is not a typically large building for the university, um, these sliding walls help to make adapt spaces to whatever the students or the professor needed at the time. Another one of my favorite projects is the Downtown Boxing Gym in Detroit. Since 2007, the Downtown Boxing Gym has providing free and academic programming to students, Detroit students age 8 to 18, with continuing mentorship through the age of 25. This philosophy started by um, Kelly Sweeney and his de development, development coordinator, Jessica Sweeney, is just phenomenal. They basically use the bribe of, I'll teach you how to box. Come on inside, I'll teach you how to box, but you've got to, you've got to take classes first. You've got to sit with tutors first. So it's books before boxing is their mento, is their, um, their idea behind this. Every single student who's gone through this gym has graduated from Detroit Public Schools. Every single one of them. With a very poor graduation rate right now with DPS, this is an amazing program that's brought people like Rachel Ray and Madonna to donate to this space. There are some pretty, pretty big players in the city of Detroit who donate to this place on an annual basis, and those sponsors are the, some, some of the reasons why we're able to get the work done that we did on this building. So like, located in Detroit's Lower East Side, um, founder and CEO Kelly Sweeney and Executive Director uh, Jessica, Jessica Hauser work with NOR to help some, solve some of the, the building's issues. The number one issue was the fact that the roof leaked. I, there are pictures online if you ever check out this website for the downtown boxing gym, not to be confused with the Detroit boxing gym. The downtown boxing gym would have buckets of water all grouped together with the flood still on the floor of of students trying to capture that water to save the space. You'd have the gym, the, the boxing ring right there, and the floor would be flooded. So that was priority number one. But in addition, one of the most important things um, for this building, and this is what it looked like before we did our work and um, construction started, was that it was poorly insulated. This used to be a book binding building. And Asbestos, in places I didn't even know it, asbestos could exist. In the caulk in the windows. Didn't know caulk in the windows could have asbestos. I knew about tile, I knew about ceiling tile, I knew about other things, but I didn't know it was in caulk too, it's in everything. So when you get to a building of this age, you have to look for everything. So we did have an abatement uh, crew come out here and take a look and test many, many of these materials. But with the windows, the sawtooth roof is beautiful, we decided to keep that because it, it allows daylighting coming in from the clear story. But this roof was a mess, just an absolute mess. So what we ended up doing is we ended up taking a look at what they wanted. We looked at everything. This, this little space that you see in the back with the, the red and white wall was their existing locker room. And that wasn't, that wasn't good. It was just a little room. Also, the office spaces and the library needed help, and there was an area where they had storage that they just, it was wasted space. 
So we decided to move the locker rooms to the other side of the building, you know, beef up the offices as best we could. They had a computer room, they have a music room, and they have an amazing library of, of books that have been donated by the community of, for kids to read. We were gonna do a little bit of everything, but the priority was to maximize the building's envelope, deal with the roof, and work on a mechanical electrical system to bring them up to code. So the client goals were try to maximize um, heating and cooling. We wanted to really improve the efficiency to above 90%. We wanted to go for a shift. Um, I'm not even going to go that. You, it's, wait until you get into building systems. You guys will learn that one. Um, ventilation, dehumidification, dehumidification controls, natural lighting, minimum of at least four hours in there for the kids. And re reduce the window to wall ratios because it was too much. There was too much glazing on this building. So we, we took it down to, to less than 20%, and our goal at the time was renewable energy with a target of 25% for future use, meaning what we're gonna put in that building. We wanted at least 25% of that energy usage to be covered by um, renewable energy. Of course, there were budgetary estimates that we had to deal with, but again, this money was all donated to the downtown boxing gym. It's not like they had this money laying around. So here's some ideas of get, to give you of what we ended up doing. Of course, this is a Revit model. We wanted to keep the sawtooth roof, but we wanted to take advantage of that nice southern exposure and put some photovoltaics on the building. We also had an area designed for geothermal for the future. So this is gonna be a geothermal high, high envelope. We went way beyond code with the envelope design, guys. This roof has an R100. The, the walls are more than an R50. And the glazing, we found that nice glazing that Tom had been looking for all that time in this building um, with an excellent R value for the glazing too. So this original book binding building got changed, got really changed. And the goal basically was to have at least 10 inches of insulation in the, in the roof. We converted to energy efficient windows we, of course, had add solar panels to the roof, but that roof was what, what was the game changer for them. And it was a mess. We had um, someone from our, our local vendor come and actually take some core samples of that roof, and um, it was in bad shape. So we stripped it, we stripped it down to, this, to the structure and did it all from scratch. And this is what it looks like today. Still not much of a change. We did change the windows in the front, change the door, couldn't do everything. So this is truly a work in progress. Um, but I just wanna say thanks to the ongoing support of generous donors. The, the downtown boxing gym can actually make a safe, healthy environment for the students who come there to learn how to box, but also learn how to be students. So on that note, we do these buildings. How can, how can we change the way we do things as, as architects. How can we change the way we design our buildings, how we work as firms, and our firm culture? You know, you, there can be people in, in a firm who are really passionate about sustainability, but how do you drive that? How do you drive a firm to change in its direction and change the way it views the world and our role in it? Architecture 2030 can really help you with that. We want to make sure that we do truly do an integrated process that we talked about earlier. Every project, no matter how big or how small, needs to start with that team from the very beginning. You know, the designer shouldn't be working in isolation. They should be working with, okay, me mechanical engineer, if I orient the building this way, what is that going to do to your systems? Because we're going to have all this heat gain coming into the building. How do we deal with that? The idea of the 2030 helps give a framework to a firm to help them move towards a path to sustainability. It connects performance to design excellence. It equates and empowers project teams. That's a key because everybody needs to feel like they have a stake in the game, that they, what they do matters. Every architect, every engineer needs to know that what they're doing matters. So I just wanna stress that there are ways that we can change culture. It starts with education, believe it or not. And I was so pleased 
Um, you're going to see something shortly, but I, I, I heard that a, a student at Lawrence Tech was actually using Cove Tool. It made me so happy. It's like, what, you're losing Cove Tool? We're just learning about it in our firm. What an amazing piece of software, and the fact that a student at Lawrence Tech was using it as part of their design. It's like, oh, it just made me so happy, I couldn't stand it. So we have the tools we need through a process that Architecture 2030 created, and AIA kind of helped flush it out. We have a sustainability action plan that we create thanks to a format that AIA created for us as, as architects to get to this path, to take this path. So that triple bottom line again keeps bringing its wonderful head up in my mind. How does a firm not only focus on sustainability, but focus on community? This is where community engagement comes into play. Norm Beck, gosh, gosh, maybe 2010, I think, created a program called Generation G, meaning Generation Green. And what we did is we started, um, one of our coworkers knew the, the principal at Cass Technical High School. And so we reached out to their architecture program through the principal and said, hey, can we come in here and teach your students some things? And we did. We usually spend two to three days with them, and we've actually spent even up to a week with them where they've ta we've taught them everything from, we actually had them build a green roof in their classroom. Like, this is how you make a green roof. We've taught them about stormwater management. We actually had them at the green garage. There's Tom and the second photo on your left, you know, with his arm up like this, that's Tom Brennan. Teaching students how to do rainfall calculations on the top was Cobo Hall, now it's TCF. Soon it's gonna change again, but that roof on Cobo Hall, or TCF Center, is huge. And how on earth do we handle all that water that hits that roof, where does it go? He helped teach the students how to do rainfall calculations to map that out and how we would get that water off the roof. We also had urban planning. We did an urban planning um, session one year where we taught students what it meant to be an urban planner and you know, things you need to think about. They ended up redesigning Cass Tech Park right across, or Cass Park right across from their, for their school. So it's really important to, to reach out to your community one of the things we also did was work with Growtown. I don't know, for those of you who know, know Ken Michael and Beth Hagenbush, um, they've done several local gardens in Detroit, uh, actually not far um, from our former building in Chrysler House. But they work with Pen the Penrose neighborhood to create um, gardens, to teach children how to garden, how to use a shovel. Like They've actually had kids hold up a shovel and say, how do I use this? It's like, how cool is that that you can teach them that, right? So we had people who would come and teach students how to garden, how to plant seeds, how to water them, and then we all harvested the, the produce at the end of the year. We also worked on their art house, which is the picture you see up on the left, how to capture rainwater. And they actually had rain barrel lessons um, at this, at this um, garden to teach neighbors how to create rain barrels. So that whole idea of connecting not only what you do as a firm, but connecting to the community in which you work is crucial. We play a part in that as well. And we've had students actually come to our office and we've taught them what architects and engineers do. So that maybe one day they might become an architect and an engineer as well. Another thing I've been actively involved in is the US, United States Green Building Council. You've heard me say USGBC several times during this presentation. It is the US Green Building Council. And I work with Detroit and the North Central region of the United States, which is Indiana, um, Illinois, Ohio. Um, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan, of course. But I've been actively involved with them. Someone, a, a dear friend of mine, actually got me involved in the Commercial Real Estate Committee with USGBC because I was, had just been finished uh, working with the Urban Land Institute and doing some public private partnership um, events with them. And so I was still interested in that commercial side of business. And so we, we got together as a group and I became the co-chair of that committee. And we did workshops and, and seminars, webinars, lunch and learns, all kinds of things to help teach our community things about energy modeling. And we had someone from Smith Group at their Building Envelope team come and actually teach what you need to look at when you do a curtain wall. You know, what are the things that you need to, as an architect to look at? So we've done tons of things. And I feel very proud of the work that I've been doing with this organization. 
There's a few things I want to highlight. One is the Sustainable Detroit Forum. Has anybody in this room been to the Sustainable Detroit Forum? Two. Oh, come on, guys. You've got to go next year. We just had our event last month. We usually do it in the fall. It's a one-day event, but it's a whole-day event. And we have everyone who's doing anything sustainably minded in the city of Detroit and its surrounding areas come to that event. Engineers, architects, community, community change makers come to this event. And to hear the stories, it's just really impressive. And every year, we highlight some school. We have, a lot of times, we have Cody High School students come. Uh, we have in several years past. They didn't come to this year's, but um, we've done, we always try to bring students to this table, and we, we give them a free pass. They come, and they get a chance to experience this. Um, we also do a soiree. The bottom left corner is actually Kelly and um, Jessica um, are in that picture because they got an award for the work that they were doing with the uh, downtown boxing gym. So the USJBC is pretty darn active in the sustainability um, perspective. But one thing I really want to focus on is the student design competition. I am chair, or was um, past chair of the Market Leadership Advisory Board. It's just basically a board that helps run the Detroit region. Um, and I'm also on the executive committee, but what, we, what I care about is the student design competition. I am the uh, chair of that committee, and Dan Farrow is actually part of the team um, on that committee. What this committee does is we create a, a student competition every year where any accredited university in the state of Michigan, whether it's urban planning, architecture, um, interior design, can actually participate depending on what, what lead project type we're following. Um, and so we invite all these universities to come and participate. Um, what's really interesting is that last year we actually reached out to every single faculty member in every single university in Michigan to get, try to get some uh, excitement and engagement going on. And what's really amazing is that this year, well, really last year's competition, because we're still working on this year's competition, which will start in spring, by the way, meaning December, so we can let faculty know. But several people from Lawrence Tech won this year's competition. And it was my absolute pleasure to be on the stage at this year's Sustainability Detroit Forum and present awards to those students. And my gosh, this is where I learned about Cove Tool. It's like someone mentioned, oh, and we did Cove. I said, why, you did Cove Tool? <laughs> I, I tell you, it was really exciting for me. Because that, that software is, if you're interested in sustainability, you want to know what your building's doing, even early on when you guys are working on your studio projects, which you guys are going to get to soon, when you work on your studio projects, this software will actually help you figure out where you're going to be with carbon or where you're going to be, you know, how you orient your site. If you, if you switch the, the, the orientation of your building and your Revit model just a little bit, what, how is that going to change your design? And Carl, if you guys can afford to get some software, this, I recommend you guys go after CoveTool, OK? It's really beneficial. So this is, this is a really th important thing to me, because Detroit um, United States Green Building Council has really helped introduce me to people who are passionate about sustainability like I am. And there's nothing better than being with like-minded people. You know, it really motivates you. It gets you more excited about things. And it's just an absolute pleasure. So on that note, I want to leave you with something. I want you have to take a minute to read this quote. He had a specific reason for saying this if anybody knows much about Oscar, but I have so much respect for this because he realized what he was doing was for certain people that could never experience the architecture he was designing. And it wasn't until he started working on public buildings and soccer stadiums <laughs> that he really understood what this meant. So I would like all of you, I'm going to task all of you with something. I'd like you to remember those who have mentored you along your career and helped you be where you are today. And I want you to carry that forward and mentor people in your future too, because you have to carry it on. And it's really important that we respect and acknowledge those who have come before us and helped us be where we are today, and the idea of you carrying it on. So I want you to find your passion. 
I want you to find what you're excited about. What is it about architecture that really excites you? And when you're in a firm and you're working with someone, I, with, with, a, with either an architecture firm, it could be, you could be anywhere, but I want you to think about community organizations or professional organizations that you can get yourself involved in. We have a lot of them. AIA Detroit, there is, my gosh, the things they do. Just amazing. United States Green Building Council. We've got the National Organization of Minority Architects, the Well Building Institute, Fitwell, all these National Buildings Institute. There's all these amazing organizations that you can get involved in. So I've, I want to leave you with one note. Be passionate and find your place because that passion not only helps you move on as a professional, but it can also help your firm move on and move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. So we have just a couple of last things to finish up for the evening. Carl will be accepting donations for software in the back of the room. <laughs> Woohoo! Cold, cold. So we'll, we'll let him get on that. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a couple of questions for Laura. She's going to be sticking around during the reception. So if we don't get to your question, you will still have an opportunity to talk to her. Um, we were joined by Afti McCooley, um, our scholarship recipient. So after we do a couple of questions, Absolutely. we'll have Afti come up here for just a minute and address you guys as well. And then we'll release you to the reception um, and kind of conclude that way. So while you guys are thinking about questions, because I know when the question thing pops up, you need just a minute to get that right. Um, I'll start with the first one, if that's okay with everybody. In the beginning of the presentation, right before we got to the Nature Center, where you did some really great work with sort of recycling and reuse mm -hmm. of materials from other projects, you talked about thinking about design in different ways, the ways that we don't typically approach design. And you talked about designing for deconstruction, mm -hmm. which is like one step even beyond reusing materials that somebody else isn't using. Mm -hmm. How do you think about design differently if you're thinking about designing for deconstruction? What are the factors that you might look at if you are interested in that strategy? Excellent question, Tracy. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I hear it. Okay. That is, it's going to be the most difficult challenge we have as architects, Tracy because there isn't enough data on materiality and how it can be reused. But I know of people across the United States who are doing that very thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mention this about the Green Garage, but when, he, when that was being designed, Tom and Peggy purposely pursued materials that they could reuse and put in their place. I mean, we looked at doors for flooring. I mean, ar architectural salvage in Detroit is just amazing. There's one in Ypsilanti too. Go to those places and try to find things. But we use the idea of everything, all the insulation is reclaimed. It's all been resalvaged. So the question is, where do we find the companies that are going to do that salvage? Because we don't have enough of them in the United States. There's someone out on, on the, the west coast um, in the upper north, northeast where he actually goes to job sites and he has a boat with a barge where he actually takes the barge and docks it and then loads it up with all this reclaimed material he's gathered from sites um, and travels wherever he needs to be, wherever it needs the, the material needs to be. He is that person who wants to take that on. But what I would really like to see us do is focus more on those materials that do have that biological component that can be broken down and back to their natural environment, their natural systems. We don't have enough research on that and there are some like, for example, you know, we can use carpet to sequester carbon. But what are they going to do with that carpet when it's done? That end of life issue they haven't resolved yet. So we're thinking in the right direction. We're just not there yet. But the fact that an architect can actually think about that when they're designing a building, you know, what, what, what's available to recycle and reuse? It, but it's that decomposition that idea of not just demoing and throwing in a, in a landfill, mm -hmm. but what can be salvaged, getting that organized, getting people to the job site to do it, and then also thinking about using those materials when we design our buildings ourselves. Okay. Excellent question. How about questions from the group here? Anybody? Start with you. Um, how do you, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, as like an architect in like working with clients, how are you balancing the need for sustainable design with like the client's need mm -hmm. and then the need to like integrate DEI into architecture and the built environment? Excellent. First of all, let's start with DEI. 
okay? ESG, DEI, right? Because they kind of go hand in hand. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. That has to start in the firm. It has to start with the firm. And every firm needs to get some kind of policy in place and, and push it. Because we need to actually re represent the community we, we work in, right? And how can you do that if you don't make a concerted effort, first of all, to even acknowledge what you have and what you don't have, find out what skills you are missing, and go after it? So that's one thing. But the idea of trying to convince clients, oh my gosh, that is one of the most difficult things in the world, right? So one of the initiatives with AIA 2030 is helping architects get the tools they need to make those kind of informative but kind and, hey, have you guys thought about this? You know? Because it is, there is a financial investment to that, right? So this is where it's going to happen. We didn't really talk about this much, but where it's going to be driven is by, I hate to say this, by, by governments, by public mandates. The reason why the UK is so far ahead of us is because their government dictates it. They expect passive house design on every building they touch. And now they're going to start making it required for every building that's ever built in the UK. Awesome. Right? Our job's done. We don't need to worry about it. Well, we still do, but that's where it's going to make change. And I think we have such resistance. For example, the National Home Builders Association. Okay? I'm, my background, I first started in residential. And the builder I work with, we were the first in the, in the state of Michigan to actually bring the idea of advanced framing, which is instead of 12 inches on center, 16 inches, or instead of 16, 24 inches on center. And you know, if you've got a gable end, you don't need to have any um, uh, kinks, all the, the jack studs and stuff that you need in windows. You don't need that support because the load's getting carried by the other wall. So the idea of educating builders and construction managers, people who are actually in the field, that's crucial too. So it's not just our clients, but it's our entire profession that influences the design that we do. Excellent question. I would, if you want to talk about that later, because there's a lot more to say about that. <laughs> Who's next? Do we have another question? Anybody from the back of the room to make me run all the way back there? I haven't gotten my steps in today. Okay, well maybe what we'll do, Laura, is give you a break, mm -hmm. because you've been talking for a bit. Ooh, and we'll, <laughs> yep, we'll give you a little rest, and then if anybody else has questions, she'll be available during the reception. What we'll do is have Afti McCooley come up here. Again, she's the first recipient of the DAA scholarship. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I have my notes here because I knew that I'm going to be emotional. <laughs> so I'm very honored to have been selected the first recipient of this DAA annual based scholarship. And I really appreciate what you do about uh, student excellence that recognize student excellence and encourage me to be able to continue my educational career and be successful architect. In addition to my academic pursuits, I'm a mother of two kids, 13 and 11, that keep me very busy and actively involved in the community events. This scholarship is a great achievement for me, and uh, I consider this as a recognition of all my effort and my passion uh, that I've put into this amazing journey to become a licensed architect. I'm very happy that I'm continuing the Master of Architecture program here at LTU, and I am really grateful about their support. They have supported me since I was transferred from Central College. Um, also, this means so much for me and my family. I get emotional because my educational pursuits would not have been possible without your generous donation. I also would like to thank my husband. He has been the biggest support for me and has always encouraged me to be able to continue my studies even during challenging times. He knows very well. 
So, dear committee, thank you all for enabling me to reach my fullest personal and professional potential. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. That application process will be coming around again this year. And so those who are graduating from the undergraduate program and looking to pursue graduate studies, please be sure that you submit the portfolio and follow the requirements. We'd love to re uh, review your qualifications and hopefully um, give another opportunity next year for that scholarship. Um, I think we're about at the conclusion. Again, Laura will be in the back with the reception if anybody else would like to stop by with any questions. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm gonna ask for one more round of applause for Laura. And with that, I think we're ready with the reception stuff in the back, I'm looking kind of I'm seeing nods, everything's good. Okay, thank you guys so much for celebrating with us, our 25th recipient of the award. Uh, please join us for the reception in the back of the room and we'll, we'll have a little bit of fellowship and opportunity to, to meet everybody and um, see you next time, next year.